Some of us have it at heart. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society, Nottingham Terrace, Buffalo, New York. It is the 22nd of August 2006, approximately 9 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Okay, I'm Tony DeCorsi, and uh, I was born November 16th, 1922. Okay, and where? Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, I went to the uh, Art Institute of Buffalo. Uh, it was on Starin, uh, let me see. Starin Avenue, I believe it was. And um, I studied sculpture there and painting. And uh, from there, uh, I went to New York City and I got a scholarship at the uh, Sculpture Center of New York. And um, since my education at the Art Institute of Buffalo, I've had many, many commissions through the years. And um, when the war broke out, I uh, went to Bell Aircraft. I worked there in a pattern <coughs> shop. And uh, also I made tool and die. Because I was a sculptor, they, they figured I fit that situation. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Curtis uh, Company, and uh, I, I made the tool and die there also. And uh, we, we were short of materials, I remember. And the foreman said to me, Tony, I want you to punch in and punch out. The close of the day, disappear. We were short of materials, that was it. So in the meantime, I'm listening to President Roosevelt. And this poor guy, he's in panic because he can't get enough men to sail those liberty ships mm -hmm. to supply the soldiers, you know, with the food, the arms, all kinds of stuff. So I was a 4F because uh, of my asthmatic condition. Uh, it would bother me in a while. So I, I couldn't stand uh, what was going on, so I went to the Coast Guard. And on a day, my breathing was fine. <laughs> so, I, instead of a 4F, they made me A1. And of course, the draft board was after me all the time. So they sent me out to uh, 47 Broadway in New York City. I was on standby pay. And um, I went on two ships and I kept uh, signing up. And uh, we went to Europe and uh, the North Atlantic uh, convoys and out of almost a thousand ships um, one third, about one third of us got back and we were, we were just lucky, you know and uh, while we were sailing in the convoy there was the English Corvette ships that were like uh, <laughs> They were like bucking broncos. They dropped deck charges, chased submarines all over the place, you know. Mm -hmm. So I said, if I ever get back in one piece. <laughs> and uh, I almost was killed three times. Now what were your duties on the oh, merchant? I'm sorry, I was, a, I was a cook on the ship. Mm -hmm. And while I was at the, uh, the uh, shipping center, there was a piano there, and while I was waiting to be called, I played the piano. So one day a man came up to me and said, I'm Sap, I forget his full name, I'm Captain So-and-so. He said, I'll tell you what, he said, if you sign on my ship, he says, I'll put a piano on the ship and all you have to do is play. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, thank you, but uh, I have to have a tr trade besides, you know, that I, I can, uh, get a job when I get back to New York. So uh, I recalled so much the day after the war was over, we were by, it was, we were in England, and um, there was a girl singing, there'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. Well, none of us had life jackets on anymore. 
because it was the war was over yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I run out on deck and I'm I'm looking at the white cliffs of Dover and it was like some sculptor had made that, you know, it was fantastic. So in the meantime, there was a man by the wheelhouse and he was screaming, he says, Oh my god, water money, water money, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? He was he was uh, so over here one of these pictures here, here, on this side of the uh, ship, I think that's the starboard, over here on the wake was the water mine. Mm -hmm. And that wake was just enough to keep that from touching us, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And for the first time, uh, every day of the war, uh, it was a regular job. For the first time I said, what in hell am I doing? What am I doing here? My face was white. You know, so they lowered a boat, and uh, at a great distance they shot the uh, water mine. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Naval Park, you'll see a water mine there. Mm -hmm. There's no explosive there, <coughs> yeah. but it was like a, a horse chestnut with little prongs, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I got back to the states, I said, "Gee, I said, I'm not going to take any other kind of a job unless it's art or music." Even if I go hungry, and I, and I didn't, I had all kinds of opportunities, you know, because mm -hmm. of my training. And um, I worked for Whitmer and Ferris, we climbed building, we paint bulletins outside, you know, stuff like that. How many trips did you make across the Atlantic? Um, I believe four trips. I signed on a ship, I was on the, the Lewis Bamberger Lumber Company ship. And then it was the George Meade. I sailed on that. And I started out as a uh, officer's mess. And um, from there on, I uh, got to be third cook on the ship. And then after um, the war was over, we were taking the boys back. And it became like a, uh, a troop ship, you know. And uh, I was in charge of the lower deck for the uh, commissary that and uh, I made more pizzas for the guys <laughs> and apple cookies you know mm -hmm. <laughs> and they gambled like crazy on this coming back and their ships were slow you know very very slow mm -hmm. so um, then uh, uh, I was trying to find my buddies you know that I, I went across uh, on the convoys with and I couldn't find them. I went to City Hall, I went all over, and it seemed like they disappeared, you know. Mm -hmm. And one man I do remember, a black fellow, he was from um, over on the east side someplace. I never forget him, his name was Basil Wilson. And he was in his 50s. I was in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. And he earned his living as a sparring partner. <laughs> and uh, when we went to Germany, Occupied Germany, the captain of the ship told us, he says, he says, some of the youth are still around, you know, they're trained in the, in the German camps, and be careful. So you travel on shore, three and four guys together all the time. Mm -hmm. you know, don't, don't, uh, don't go alone, see. And, uh, now, did, was Basil Wilson on the ship with you? Yes, he was what? my shipmate. Mm -hmm. yes. What were his duties? Uh, I think he was a deckhand. Mm -hmm. That's what he was. And uh, I even offered to, uh, when he went on shore, he went on shore alone. I said, gee, let me go, go with you. No, no, he said, I can take care of myself. Yeah, he yeah, didn't quit, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, now, there were, were there many blacks on, on uh, merchant marine ships? Um, just just one black fellow, mm -hmm. but they were all different nationalities. Mm -hmm. The uh, the bosun on one of our ships, I think he was uh, Puerto Rican, and uh, he liked to make wall hangings. That was kind of his hobby, you know, out of all kinds of cloth, and and he used to give me blocks of wood because the, the uh, uh, if they needed. Uh, cabinets on the ship and things like that wouldn't, he made those things and uh, all I had to carve was a boat knife 
which is used for ropes mm -hmm. and for tying off. And um, when I came back, uh, I remember Albrecht's bookstore over on, uh, I, forget, I forget what it was, on Main, Main, Main Street. Street, yes. And they gave me a one-man show. Mm -hmm. And the drawings I made uh, while I was on ship and little watercolors they did, they gave me a show of those pieces. And uh, the blocks of wood I carved were like wave formations. You know, and the paint and the things I painted, people said to me, "Well, these are what are you a caricature artist? And what is this supposed to be?" I said, "No, wait a minute. <laughs> I've been on ships where the swells in the water were forty and fifty feet high. You couldn't see the ship across from me. You couldn't even see the mast on the ship." Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was a good start. You know, I, I started having. One man shows, and mm -hmm. and um, in uh, 1955 I had my own uh, modern gallery on um, uh, Elmwood Avenue, up on the second floor, and uh, these were artists who were interested in the modern um, concept. Also, when I was a little boy, uh, four or five years old. Uh, my father read a letter from, to my mother from his uncle, who was Emile Bordel. Now, Emile Bordel was the uh, assistant of Rodin, a man who created the thinker, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And um, my father took me to the show, and I saw these bronze pieces, and I went crazy. <laughs> I started to touch them, and my father stood in front of me so the guards wouldn't see me doing that, see? So when I got home, my, my dad says, Anthony, uh, here's a block of clay you can play with. My father was also an artist. He was, he was from Italy. He was a beautiful woodcarver. Mm -hmm. And um, so the first thing I made was a, a female torso. And when my mother saw it, she was, oh, she was excited, you know. She put it in a cabinet where it was glass for, for, for other things she had collected. And I think after a few weeks or so, my dad sent the piece, he wrapped it up, and he sent it to his uncle. So in a few months later, the piece came back, but it was heavier. Bordell had casted it in bronze. Uh -huh. And he said to my father, he, and the note said, Christy, your son is a sculptor. Uh -huh. And from there on, uh, Everything I, I worked for sign companies, I worked for, I, uh, and my, of course my hero, when I was 16 years old, was Pablo Picasso. Now, there's a, there's a picture over here of the uh, bison I made when I was 14 years old at the uh, Museum of Science, and it was, a, it was a competition, and I won the competition for a that I won the, out of a thousand drawings, mine, mine won the prize. See, and that, and that uh, when I was 16, I read about Picasso, and I took the students at the Art Institute of Buffalo, Mr. Bell, never to get, to get him. And when I showed this little book to people, it said 40 years of the work of Picasso. So I was called into the principal's office. Don't you bring that back here to school, you got to leave. <laughs> and I said, okay. Then there was another student that got the same treatment. He brought a book of Van Gogh, you know. In other words, the principal didn't want students cutting off their ears, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> so then I, I got a job at the, um, my teacher was Jean McKay uh, Hendrix when she got married. And she was my great friend at the Art Institute. And uh, she looked at one of my sculptures and said, why don't you take one of your sculptures to Stanley Kraska? I said, who is that? He says, he's making the cement animals for the entrances of the park zoo. See? So when I took my sculpture to show him, he was very impressed. He says, you can get these pieces started with clay, and, I, and I'll finish everything. I, I can use you. But being 16 years of age, I wasn't old enough to be in the WPA. Mm -hmm. 
So he suggested he put me on the, uh, he gave me a connection with the NYA, National Youth Administration. So that was wonderful. They sent me to the Museum of Science, Buffalo Museum of Natural Sciences, and um, they had suitcases that would open, they would, they would bring them to schools for the kids to look at was a cotton field or, or mining or, and I made all the wax animals for that and, and uh, the figures and my friend, I'll never forget him, Vince McCandy, he was a pharmacist and he was out of work. <laughs> he, made, he made little furniture for me out of wood and stuff like that. It was wonderful. You know, here um, I'm uh, at that age and I'm getting paid for my work and I, how wonderful that was. Mm -hmm. And then the Flatiron Building downtown in Buffalo, um, I painted some murals for the old post office building. Uh, big panels uh, depicting young people doing uh, electricity or carpenter work or sports and, and uh, big, big murals I painted for them. And, um, and it was great, you know, it was just, uh, and uh, my father was so pleased, you know, with what I was doing. And, uh, Could I go back to your military experiences? Uh, oh, sure. A bit? Please, I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. No, that was very interesting. Um, you said in this form that you filled out for us about learning where to throw your garbage. Oh, on the ship. On the Could ships. you tell us about that? We had to be very careful. Yes, and um, and of course uh, there was a. We never knew where we were going. Mm -hmm. they, maybe we were 100 miles or 200 miles offshore, and then they'd open up the orders to see what we, what we were going to do. And at that point, uh, at night, we had to be careful how we opened up the hatch doors for lights. Mm -hmm. You know, we could have got killed. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, the garbage, yeah, we had to get rid of it, but we, very carefully. <laughs> so, and uh, why did you have to check the direction of the wind? They they told me about it, and I told them that I thought they were pulling my leg, you know, but but they weren't. I threw it in the wrong direction. And I was I was covered with <laughs> it looked like Russian dressing. <laughs> so, and uh, and we had good times on the ship. There was one fellow on the ship. His name was uh, Herbert, no, Hubert Herbert. He was a black guy. He was a big, tall guy. And uh, he was in uh, the mess uh, department I was in. He'd wait on tables and stuff like that. And he was in a production, I guess, in New York City of a play called Anna Lucasta, something like that. And, um, and, uh, so, let me see. Oh, in, in Bremerhaven, I saw the ship being worked on uh, a, a passenger ship. In fact, the, um, you could see the welding uh, going on all night mm -hmm. and things like that. And uh, since I didn't smoke, I used to get cigarettes at the shop on the, on the ship and trade it for Rhine wine and stuff like that, I'm sure. <laughs> And uh, guys would buy uh, trade cameras, and I, they give me chocolate, and I trade it for different things with the people there, you know. Mm -hmm. And no, I don't, I don't think a lot of those people knew in Bremerhaven what was going on in the, in the ovens and stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is hard to believe, mm -hmm. you know, because their history books talking about Hitler, he was like our president, you know, he was a great honor and, and all kinds of stuff like this. And one man came up to me and he tried to sell me a lamp with a shade and he said it was guaranteed, he said it was made out of a jewel. Mm. So instead of getting angry, I said, well, I said, I, I don't really can use a lamp in my home. I said, I use candles. <laughs> and this guy walked away muttering to himself. But a lot of these people didn't know what was going on. Is it, is, it, it's hard to believe that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met some wonderful people in Germany, you know. But, uh, now this was at the end of the war. 
this, yeah, this is occupied Germany. This is occupied Germany. And also... Now, were you still in the Merchant Marines? Yes. Yet? Oh, yes. Well, what years were you in the Merchant Marines? 1945. Uh -huh. Okay. And, uh, yeah, when I, when I left Curtis to, to, to join, you know, that's what they, that's where they sent me. And, um... Now, were you ever under attack by submarines? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, the Corvette ships. Mm -hmm. They were small, and they, they'd heel over this way, you know. And these guys must have been like cowboys to, to run these ships. And they, they dropped depth charges. They were chasing submarines all mm -hmm. over the place, you know. And um, that's, what, that's what I remember. And I remember, I remember whales, I remember porpoise. Mm -hmm. And when we go, and the uh, port cap, the port captain would guide us to the, the harbor we were going, but the porpoises were ahead of us. They showed us mm -hmm. where the sandbars were, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, amazing. Just these animals were just, just, uh, uh, and I, I did a lot of artwork when I was on the ship, mm -hmm. and a lot of times the. the uh, I remember when we went to um, Antwerp, Belgium, we were late because we were in a storm and the, and the ships ahead of us were sunk. In Holland, this is Holland now. And uh, so on the way back from Holland, uh, we were attacked by a, a Messerschmitt airplane. And uh, my two buddies, we were midship, and his plane swooped down at us, and uh, the other two guys got killed. Mm -hmm. And if one man had fallen on me, where I hurt my, I slammed on the deck, I would have been dead. And uh, that was the second time I uh, wasn't wiped out. Mm -hmm. And the, and the third time, the last time was uh, the lifeless of Dover. You know that was that was the most scary. That one just just uh, you look at each other and you see. And for years, mines, water mines were there, and land mines were there. You know? you never, what, what was the life like on the ship? Uh, what kind of food did you have? You being oh, a cook? Uh, the company um, I had the ships. Uh, the steward would uh, make the menus out, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the food was good. And they had a baker, there was uh, a second cook and baker, and uh, I could have never made the baker because of my asthmatic condition. You, you had to work with flour, you know, mm -hmm. something terrible. So, so I was happy being a third cook. I made salads, I made breakfast, and, uh, and the, I remember the captains on the ship, they would love kippers in the morning. A little fish, I guess they mm -hmm. were, you know. And uh, and I was always afraid of, um, when I served in the officer's mess, that I would stumble, you know, <laughs> get, get hot soup on somebody. And it, it, it did happen. But we weren't sailing, we were in port. And this one guy, engineer, he was tough. He carried a knife in his boot all the time. He was, a, he was an engineer, and he was from the South, you know, and uh, of course he didn't like Yankees too much, you know. And uh, who did I spell it on? Him. <laughs> I said, oh, this, this, is, this is the worst, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and then I met a, uh, a radio, radio operator. I met some great guys on the ship, you know, and, uh, and, um, they even let me uh, take the wheel in the wheelhouse because I, I wanted to, you know, they figured mm -hmm. well. And uh, that was great. And I remember when we went to Boston, uh, one of the uh, officers invited me to his home. And, uh, and of course, with my asthmatic condition, I, I was always well when I was at sea. <laughs> it was wonderful, you know. The air was fresh and uh, no pollens and stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. But when I went to this fellow's home, uh, the, uh, all the things that irritated me were in the city, you know. <laughs> so I had to sleep on the ship. <laughs> that was all right, you know. 
What what kind of things did your ships, the two ships you were on, the, the four voyages you made, what were some of the things you carried on the ships? Uh, oh, wow. Uh, what I was always worried about, we had tanks on our ships. I said, my God, if they ever break loose, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I remember one incident where uh, there was a soldier, uh, when we became a transport to take the soldiers back from the war, there was one poor guy who begged them that he, could he fly back. He, would, he got so seasick, you know, and uh, terrible. So uh, they wouldn't grant him this thing. He was a, a, just a regular soldier, you know. Mm -hmm. So when the hospital ship was across from us, we were going to lower this guy and take him to the, he died of pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, on the hospital ship, there were nurses there. So all the whole crew went over to the starboard side, you know, and the, and the ship was doing this. <laughs> the captain comes out with a rifle, and he says, everybody spread out, and he, he's ready to shoot somebody, you know. <laughs> so we, so they all did it, they spread out, you know. And uh, I remember going to uh, a place called w uh, Barry, England, which was on the uh, south west coast. This is Welsh country. And for the first time I heard uh, on a Saturday night they would they would roll a big uh, upright piano in the square and these people would sing. They had no music education at all. You should hear these Welsh singers they were it would melt you. These are coal miners, you know, stuff like that. And uh, I managed to call uh, Henry Moore, uh, a couple I always admired. Toronto has full of uh, mm -hmm. beautiful work he did. So he invited me out to his studio, and I said, "Gee, I said I I appreciate that, but I I got to stand by. I'm a cook on the ship, you know." And uh, so I you guess, actually got to meet him. No, oh. I talked to him on the phone, oh, okay. I, and I, he invited me there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, a late friend of mine, Joe Belinsky, who was, who was at State, the State Buffalo State for years, taught sculpture. Mm -hmm. He went to see Henry Moore. Henry Moore wanted to hire him as his assistant, but Joe said, "I'm, I got my own work to do. That's what I, you know, I want to get at my things." You know. So, uh, and that's the first time at one of the fairs there in Barrie, where I ever had tea already made with milk in and the sugar in. And, and it was a good thing because it was chilly in that part of the, uh, uh, England, you know. And the uh, coast and the waters there were rough, just, just, uh, and I remember La Havre, France. I wanted to meet Picasso. Like we couldn't get ashore, there was bombing going on on shore. And, also, uh, my um, I brought this. Wait a minute, is it now? I brought a. And, uh, oh, here it is. For this piece of work, uh, before I went away. I made I made a um, a sculpture. It was in, inspired by a man by the name of Paul Wilson, who was a great American singer. And I heard him sing in, in the first production of Shogo um, in the late thirties, I believe it was. And he sang Old Man River. Well, this this this. Uh, started me off with this piece to, to, to build this piece and uh, I like the sponsor for this piece made it. Here's, this is Paul Wilson mm -hmm. and I met him in, in 1943 after a production of uh, Othello and um, he was my friend. I, I said I like to sing 
being on uh, the ocean, I met different nationalities and I want to be able to sing all these songs, you know. We had breakfast the next day after this uh, production he was in and uh, I was working at a cafeteria in New York City, I think Silverman's, and he met me there, we had breakfast. And th this cafeteria was a place where all kind of uh, uh, artistic people would go to eat, you know. And um, I met, I met also the late uh, Fiorello LaGuardia. When he became mayor, the newsreel said, uh, well, he says, uh, your talk about putting a fireman in the fire department and police the policeman was all campaigning talk. And he says, the hell it was. So I called him up on the phone. And I told him, I said, uh, he talked with me. And I said, uh, I'm a student at the Clay Club, the Art Sculpture Center of New York. And uh, this, this is what I do, you know. And he said, uh, he says, where are you now? I said, I'm at Silverman's. I, I make pans of uh, beans and potatoes and all kinds of stuff. He says, will you be there all day? I said, yeah. I said, okay. So he called, he has a briefcase like this. He brings in, I see him. And uh, what he showed me was, he was, a, a, I guess, a World War I pilot, uh, a plane. And he had pictures of him with his goggles on, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, it was it was great, and I even met the the brother of um, Gert Schutzstein, who who was the collector of Picasso's, Matisse's, you know, all these people. And her brother, he called himself uh, Homer. And when he came to the cafeteria, he dressed. He had a Roman toga, on. <laughs> and. It, and he'd recite his poetry and stuff like that. I met some wonderful people in Manhattan. It was a great place. And uh, I even saw the uh, first production of um, the Three Penny Opera, which they did in <coughs> Buffalo years later at the Richmond Hotel. It was called the Off Broadway Theater up on the fourth floor. And uh, through Gus Macheris, who designed the Bichas um, when I, I used to work there, I was the intermission piano player there. Uh, I made a tragic and comedy mask for the theater there. And I, it, was, it was great. I met some wonderful people at the Sheraton Hotel. You couldn't uh, phone people who came there to perform. In Buffalo, I met Liz Taylor. And uh, there was a table where the employees would have their lunch and supper. But she peeked in the side door and she said, uh, he says, do you mind if I sit and have lunch with you? She says, I don't like being noticed all the time. <laughs> I says, yeah, sure. And um, uh, I met the uh, Kingston Trio and I met uh, two-ton Tony Galento, who fought Joe Lewis. <laughs> and, and he had the most gentle voice you ever heard. I think it's sophistication was uh, barroom brawling. That's what he liked to do, you know. And um, I met some great people. I was with the Sheraton Hotel six years, which, which is unheard of, because part of my job was playing that piano and uh, putting rolls on. And, and I didn't have to pump it <clears throat> besides playing. And I made up a drum set to play along with it. And um, Scott Joplin, I had a lot of his music. I still love uh, 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 what am I saying now? Uh, I forget the kind of the music. Ragtime. Ragtime. I even had a ragtime band some years back. And uh, Eli Konikoff, a very famous uh, mm -hmm. trombone player, he was part of my group. It was Jack Massman, it was uh, uh, Bill Riley played tuba, and uh, my union looked after me. I was I was in the union when I was 18 years old, and I'm still a member. And also, um, I worked with uh, Doc Severinsen one year, and uh, 
and he called me up, he used to call me from the Philharmonic and say, can we sell you a subscription, you know, to, to the concert? I said, well, I earn my living as a musician, mostly. But and the lady said, no, no, call your union. And, and uh, so I called the union and I said, what's, what's going on? This is Thursday now. And I talked to the president and I said, what's, what's happening? Am I in trouble or something? <laughs> No, no, he says, this is Thursday, you're going to meet Doc Severinsen at the Kyan Music Hall Friday at 12 o'clock, and, and you're going to be in a concert Saturday. I said, what? <laughs> He's, he says, don't worry, just show up with your, in, your small instrument that you play, you know. And um, so I showed up. I'm there with my little button accordion, you know, which fit in my sea bag when I went sailing, perfect. So I can hear the guys in the front. So you could play the accordion when you're on the ships. Yes, yeah. yes. My button accordion is this big, mm -hmm. so it fit in my sea bag perfect. So the guys in the orchestra were saying, "What in hell is he going to do with that toy he's carrying?" But when Doc saw me, he said, uh, "Oh, he says you're a godsend." He says, "You should see what they send me sometimes, you know." He said, "Okay." He said, "Can you play all day long?" I said, "I don't know." So he said, looked at me and says, okay. He says, what do you do? I <laughs> says, well, huh? and this program is called A Night in Old Italy to the Philharmonic. I said, well, how about if I sing Wayne Marie, I do an Italian mazurka and a tarantella and wind up with Santa Lucia. Fine. So he could, he treated me like he knew me for 20 years. I used to watch him on the Johnny Carson show. And I said, gee, this man is... People love him, you know, he's so, uh, uh, he communicates with people. So he could see I was worrying about something. He was not worrying about the, the Philharmonic, but here's, here's what happened. The night of the concert, a lady came up to me and said, Mr. DeCorsi, this, is, this never happens. You're on this list as an accordion player. He says, there's no such thing with a bubble Philharmonic. <laughs> so I said, oh, that's nice. So, after I finished uh, the last song, Santa Lucia, people stood up and applauded like mad, and, and Doc had uh, mandolin players w with me, and, and guitars, and bass, and, and so when I got my applause, he opened the microphone and he says, now, three, four weeks before, Luciano Pavarotti was singing it. And that's what was worrying me. I said, oh my God, I hope I don't get some of this thing on me. What the hell can I do? <laughs> so when I finished my last song, he said over the microphone, he says, and eat your heart out, Pavarotti. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that was wonderful. I've been on that stage three times as a soloist. And um, so anyway, what else can I tell you? Well, you, you mentioned that your uh, ships were called the Rust Bucket Brigade. Why was that? Oh, in the article there, if you want to keep the article also, when my buddies and I used to go into the New York Harbor going out on ships, a lot of those ships, they didn't have time to paint them. And they were, a lot of them were rusty, mm -hmm. you know, because none of them, a lot of them didn't come back. So our black joke was, here comes the Rust Bucket Brigade. <laughs> so well, that leads us into, why don't you tell us a little bit about the sculpture you made and why you, that's I guess why you call it the Rust Pocket. Yes. Could you tell us about that? Where is it and, and why is it there and so on? Well, uh, this, this is at Naval Park now. Okay, this if you hold it up to the camera, Wayne can get Right. There. And of course this is the... This piece is this here, and I built this piece at the uh, Center for the Arts. Could, could the, you hold that piece up? Hold yeah, well, I'm sorry. Now, what, what is the material that that's made this of? This is bronze. bronze. Okay. I studied bronze uh, cast. Okay. You can put it down there. And um, so I uh, made this at the... Uh, College there. I've been a, like a credit free student for many, many years. They still invite me to, all I have to do is pay for the materials, mm -hmm. you know, and um, 
Now, what college are you referring to? The Buffalo, Buffalo uh, uh, University of Buffalo. University of Buffalo. A center for the arts. Okay. And um, all I had to do was pay for the materials I used. Now, this piece I, I cast there, and also I needed a, a, a piece to put it on. And uh, although I had The first article that about my money was this. I was getting the runaround. In fact, it's in there. And uh, nobody could listen to me at City Hall. And, and the, kind of, the Merchant Marine was kind of, uh, you know, they talked badly about us. Now, in my collection, my, 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 uh, my sea chest, I have a letter from Ronald Reagan, a copy, where in 1988 he got his benefits. He was on our side. You know, mm -hmm. and that, that that was wonderful. I go to the VA and I get my medicine there, what I need, and uh, I talk to a lot of those people. So the second article that came out said that the people of Buffalo were sending me monies for the to build this monument. Nobody else would help me. And then when City Hall saw this, <laughs> they wanted to be in on it. So I I showed my uh, my model to to the uh, late, uh, the ex-Mayor Griffin, Jimmy Griffin. And he liked what he saw, and, and, and uh, then he put me in touch with the um, uh, James Pitts, who was the president of the Common Council, see? So I went to him and told him, he said, this is beautiful. He says, how much do you need? <laughs> I said, well, $10,000 would do it, I need. African black granite, the way, I, the way I designed it. He said, I don't know what the hell I'm going to get the money, but you'll get it. And he did. He came right, he came right through. And that's how this got built. You know. Now, you said it's in the Naval Park. For those that don't know, where, where is the Naval oh, Park? Oh, the Marina Basin, where the, in food, downtown where the ships yeah. are, those okay. two big ships. Mm -hmm. And they, they got my, uh, my uh, monument in the most wonderful spot. There's a little mound there. And then back are the two ships, the destroyer and I guess some the other cruiser. kind of a ship. Yeah, a cruiser. Yeah. And I also wanted in my article to have a bench where people could sit down. And when I called him a couple weeks back, the man who was in charge of the park, he says, Tony, he says, we're putting a second bench in there. I said, oh, that's, that's wonderful, you know. Now, could you tell us about this? Yes, this here piece. Um, when the dedication came to this, uh, Colonel Cunningham was there, and he said, Tony, he said, my son is a merchant mariner. Could you put something on our, our wall, you know, uh, uh, explain? And I said, sure, I'd be, I'd be glad to. And once again, I raised the money for that. And, um, then this is cast at the uh, 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 Center for the Arts, and uh, we put the piece up, and, uh, well, fathers and sons, that, that says a lot. Mm -hmm. The sun is looking out towards the sea, and this is me looking into the past. Mm -hmm. Now, who's, who posed for the sun, you told us earlier? Oh, I posed for the father. Right. And um, this fellow was um, Bob Fisk. He lives out in Silver Creek. He was he was a merchant marine also. And um, so now, was that monument up? No, it, the they're other. making a new a building there in Naval Park, which will be a museum, mm -hmm. and this will be there because this was on the wall be before they they moved everything mm -hmm. up front. And uh, also, let me see. Now, did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was on the ship with you? After I couldn't locate anyone. Just mm -hmm. I went to City Hall. I I looked all over and. Uh, one of the fellows was at the Art Institute, Don Burns, I remember him. I used to see him in New York, and he was a painter, a very good painter. And um, 
That's it. I, lo I lost. I lost, especially my friend David Wilson. Mm -hmm. he, he was uh, quite a man, and uh, so I. And at the VA hospital, before we got involved uh, in Iraq, you couldn't talk about the war to these people. They would be in tears. And after that war started, they want to talk about it. They feel related to what's going on. See? And um, I met some great people at, at the VA hospital. Just, just wonderful. How do you think your time in the Merchant Marine had an effect on your life? Much. In what ways? Much. I, well, I said I survived this, and I'm never going to take another job uh, doing carpenter work or anything like that. I want to be in music and uh, in art, and that's it. And all my jobs uh, uh, were connected, and I, I never went hungry. <laughs> and my wife, she's a puppeteer. Yeah. Yeah. Her? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's her, that's Jean. And um, I met her in the 60s when I was at the Sheraton Hotel. I worked there uh, six days a week. And uh, I met her at Fantasy Island, uh, on Grant Island. And I was with a, uh, a friend of mine who was in show business. She was like Gypsy Rose Lee. <laughs> She, her name was Ann Bang Bang Arbor. She'd do a strip, but she'd be making these funny comments while she was doing the strip, you know. And, uh, and uh, I worked at Frank's Casanova and, uh, uh, in those early days. And at that time, Calypso music was coming in. Harry Belafonte and people like that, and the Easy Riders. So I went to a, an agent, and I said, that's what I want to do. I want to. And the guy said, well, only black people do, do color something there. He said, no, that's not right either. So I finally found an agent. And uh, he said, well, you can't use your name, Tony DeCourcy, as, as a Calypso singer. What can you come up with? I said, all right, how about calling me Prince Invader? <laughs> Good. He said, that's great. So, so they. So they uh, booked me into the Frank's Casanova on Bailey Avenue, and um, my boss, Buster, he called up my agent and he says, what in the hell are you doing? What's this guy doing? What is he supposed to be doing? The agent said, calm down. He says, in two, three weeks, he says, all hell will break loose. Calypso is in now. Harry Belafonte. So, okay, the boss was calming down. So then I was there seven nights a week for seven months. I, could, I didn't, And I needed work, you know. And I, I didn't care whether I worked for a whole year after that. It was, it was, uh, and I met this uh, Ann Arbor, um, uh, kind of a classy exotic she was. And she was my girlfriend, you know. And uh, through her, I met my wife over at Fantasy Island. And, uh, and I was so poor, I couldn't even afford a key for skates, you know, in those days, see. But she drove a, a white Cadillac, <laughs> a, a, what do they call it, a top rolled back or something. Oh, a retractable hard top? Yeah, right, something. No, I, I think it was, yeah. And she picked me up <coughs> where I was living at the, um, over on Elmwood. And uh, she, she liked to take me out for milkshakes and stuff like that. This is her big kick, you know. And when I took her to the Albright, the Ivan Albright Gallery at the time, she was so pleased that, that uh, I introduced her to art and things like that. And, and back in the days of, uh, I remember, uh, the Kennedy administration, I met a lady by the name of Nina Freudenheim. She has a gallery now. And uh, she commissioned me. Uh, they were, she wanted to feature fashion with uh, Jackie Kennedy's pillbox hats, mm -hmm. you know? So I wrote uh, Main Street USA and I had a trio and everything. And uh, 
and uh, it was just great. And I, I, I met some, I never wanted to leave, you know, when I came back from New York, uh, I was there off and on maybe 20 years, you know, and I saw the Museum of Modern Art, I met uh, a lot of people, I met Al Hirschfield, you ever heard of him? He, he did caricatures. Oh yes, and drawings, yeah. And I, I met him once in uh, Times Square, it was winter, it was Christmas, I knew who he was, and I said, you're Al Hirschfield. He said, I am. He said, let's get out of this cold, damn cold. So, so we went in a, in a place across the street, and you sat at a counter with school stool, and it was like a conveyor belt, see? And it's Christmas time, and uh, you ordered, you ordered, I ordered. Well, all they sold was spaghetti and meatball. That's all they sold, you know? <laughs> so here comes this plate with green spaghetti and meatballs, and I told him, I said, See, aren't, aren't they smart in business? They said, it fits the Christmas season. He says, no, he says, that's spinach spaghetti you're eating. <laughs> and and uh, so I had a wonderful time in New York, but I, but I, could, I had no place to, uh, to do anything. When I came back to Buffalo, my house was filled with, with stuff, you know, through the years. And, um, and it was wonderful to get back to Buffalo and, and just have, uh, I, I traveled all over New York City. Uh, I met Burl Ives. I went on his houseboat on the Harlem River, I believe it was. My friend said, you like Burl Ives, don't you? I said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a folk singer. That's, that's what I, I like to do. I sing in different languages and everything. So we, we got to his houseboat, 10 o'clock in the evening, and he's drinking. And he's with his guitar, and he, he sang till 10 o'clock the next morning. He didn't repeat one song. I said, oh, do I have a long way to go? <laughs> but he, he was wonderful. Just, just, uh, I wanted to meet Woody Guthrie, but I never could run across him. He wrote like the dust and old ballads, and, and, um, and uh, when I went to Arizona to live, I worked in uh, aircraft. They made these trainer planes for Chinese pilots at the time. And that was kind of interesting. I made structural work out of wood, and the ladies, they made they canvas uh, around it. It was built with canvas, too. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Well, thank you for inviting me.